So in the uh, uh, in 1926, Ernest Hemingway published a novel titled The Sun Also Rises. And there's a line from it that has been uh, used and, and uh, reused and attributed, wrongly attributed to a whole lot of other people. Um, but basically, w it was a piece of dialogue in, uh, in, a, in a scene that takes place in Santiago, Chile. And he says, uh, how do you go bankrupt, Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said, gradually and then suddenly. And it's, you know, what they're describing is tipping points, you know, these, these points where things that, that are progressing along in a linear fashion, suddenly something changes and they go from linear to logarithmic or, or some other, uh, you know, mathematical, uh, 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 whatever you call it, um, you know, a way of describing things. And uh, I, I, you know, we're seeing incredible climate change here. Let's ask an expert about this. Dr. Michael Mann is on the line with us, a distinguished professor of meteorology and the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, recipient of the Tyler Prize, author of several books, uh, most recently, The New Climate War. Michael Mann with two N's dot net is his website. His Twitter handle is Michael E. Mann with two N's. Uh, Dr. Mann, welcome back to, or Professor Mann, or Dr. Mann, welcome back to the, uh, to the program. Um, have we entered a new phase of climate change? I mean, 116 degrees here in Portland? Yeah, uh, Tom, it's always good to be with you, my friend. Um, you know, uh, we are seeing some remarkable impacts of climate change now playing out in real time uh, on our television screens. Uh, it, it reminds me of a, another uh, great Ernest Hemingway uh, novel, uh, The uh, Snows of Kilimanjaro, oh, yeah. uh, because the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro are literally disappearing before our eyes. Uh, that sort of legendary ice cap um, on this majestic mountain in the equator with, with giraffes and zebras looming in the foreground, that ice cap is going to be gone. And so we are seeing unprecedented changes take place. But this last few weeks, the extreme weather events that we've seen, uh, I think really sort of crystallize one basic fact. The signal has now emerged from the noise. A decade or two ago, if you had asked me, was this climate, you know, was this extreme weather event impacted by climate? Was that extreme weather event impacted by climate? I would have had to say, well, you know, we have to perform a study using climate models, seeing how much more often that sort of event becomes when you add greenhouse gases, um, and maybe we can tease out the signal. Well, that's not where we are now. We don't have to tease out the signal. It's playing on our television screens before us in the form of these unprecedented heat waves and droughts and wildfires and floods, superstorms. This is climate change. And the signal has emerged from the noise. Dangerous climate change, by some measure, is here. And the real issue is how bad are we willing to let it get? The, the, we, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we, that we are now at about 1.1 degrees of climate change since the pre-industrial baseline? Uh, it's more like 1.2, actually, okay. um, and it's increasing by about 0.2 Celsius, you know, nearly half a degree Fahrenheit per decade now. So uh, that that's that seems nonlinear, too. <laughs> it's, uh, this is, well, it's, that, that'll, that's linear, but it's bad enough because that means you intersect two degrees Celsius, let alone one and a half degrees Celsius, which many scientists say is the danger limit. You intersect two degrees Celsius in a matter of decades if we continue just on this linear path that we're on. And so right. it really underscores the fact we've, we've got to decarbonize our economy very quickly now. Well, and, and my question where I was going with that was, you know, we're already at 1.2 degrees and we've been operating on this assumption and the, you know, the Paris Accords and, the, and, and all the other ones prior to that. Uh, we're operating on the assumption that two degrees was the point at which we should really, really start to freak out. And uh, I'm really starting to freak out here at 1.2 degrees. I mean, this, uh, I, we've got trees all over here in Oregon that are, that are dying right now that, yeah. that have, you know, 100-year-old trees, uh, the, you know, of, of all different species, plants that are dead. Um, there's now this giant uh, hot blob off the coast of Oregon that seems to be affecting our weather. Um, but it has killed, uh, it, it is killing the, the sea life, particularly the bottom-dwelling sea life uh, through hypoxia. 
uh, by you know right. by depriving them of oxygen, um, and and that's I mean there's it's like every little thing that yeah. you can identify as a separate discrete component has all these multiplier effects, and and uh, you know do we need to reevaluate this? I want I, I understand that the IPCC yeah. is coming up with a new report, uh, maybe as much maybe as early as next month. Um, do you have any insights into that and, and you know, uh, how bad it is now, how bad it's going to get, and, and, what, and, and, and how do we go about rapidly decarbonizing our environment? What are the recommendations being made? Yeah, so um, that new report is scheduled for early 20, uh, 2022, so, um, but they are finalizing uh, that report. It's going through its final uh, round of review. Uh, here's the thing about those reports. There generally aren't any surprises because they are based on the existing scientific literature. And so we already know more or less what the IPCC is going to conclude. And what they're going to conclude is that the warming is pretty much on pace. The warming of the planet is as we predicted, and as you allude to, we're at 1.2, we're warming 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. It doesn't take you know, complicated mathematics to figure out that we cross that threshold uh, pretty quickly, that threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius, nearly three Fahrenheit, and two degrees Celsius, much worse if we don't decarbonize our economy. Um, so that's what the IPCC is basically gonna say. They're gonna say, look, the warming uh, continues as long as we continue to burn fossil fuels. We understand that. Um, the warming of the planet may be proceeding more or less as the models predicted, but some of these impacts um, are taking place sooner or they're playing out in a more dramatic fashion than the models anticipated. And that includes the melting of ice and the, the rise of sea level. And it includes these extreme weather events that we're seeing. And there are these knock-on effects because we talk about tipping points in the climate system. But even aside from the question of whether these are tipping point elements in the climate system, the impacts involve tipping points, involve thresholds. Um, there's only so much warming that these ocean biota that you're talking about can endure. And we've seen millions of organisms die out off the Pacific Northwest coast in recent weeks because of this unprecedented warmth that simply exceeds the level that they can cope with. The same thing will happen with us. Large parts of the planet will become too hot for humans basically to exist if we continue on the course that we're on. So there are these knock-on effects. These are the, there are these amplifying factors. And there are these thresholds that some amount of warming, we exceed our adaptive capacity as a species. We cross that threshold. And, and that's where we start to talk about societal collapse. That's a possible future, but it doesn't have to be our future. What the science also tells us is that if we can get our act together later this year, COP26 in Glasgow, we have to make sure that all the countries of the world make commitments that will have our carbon emissions within a decade. Let's stop talking about what happens at 2050. That's kicking the can way down the road. We've got to talk about what happens by 2030. We've got to bring those carbon emissions down by factor two. That means we need policies that will get us there. And there is still this sort of implementation gap where some countries are saying, look, we're, we're going to do this. We pledge to bring our carbon emissions down by factor two. And yet their policies um, are not in line with those promises. We have to make sure that governments are backing up those commitments with actual policies that get us off fossil fuels as quickly as possible and move us towards a, a greener, cleaner economy. Well, and this is where, you know, uh, I, I, it seems like one of the things that the fossil fuel industry has has promoted and, and, the, and the climate deniers uh, well, it's, this isn't quite climate denial. It's, it's kind of a soft version of it. Right. Is yeah. uh, it's all about individual responsibility. You need to turn off your light bulbs. And the simple reality is, we can all turn off our light bulbs when we're not using them, and that's not going to have even one one thousandth of the impact of a national policy of imposing a carbon tax, for example. That this has yeah, to be done at the level of yeah. government. It's absolutely right, Tom. It's a major theme of my book, The New Climate War. It's one of the, the, the uh, sort of tactics that are being used by the forces of inaction, fossil fuel interest polluters, to prevent us from getting off of fossil fuels. Look, d as you allude to, they've sort of uh, evolved away from denial because you can't deny what's uh, plainly evident to uh, people who are watching the news, who are watching their television screens. So instead, they've turned to these other tactics, and one of them is deflection. 
is deflecting attention away from the needed systemic changes to individual behavior, as if it's just about you and me, you know, going vegan and doing, uh, you know, and, and, and not flying anymore. Um, it's very convenient for polluters to make it about you and me when, in fact, you and I can't provide subsidies for renewable energy. We can't block new fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, we can't provide incentives uh, for renewables, uh, pricing on carbon. All these things that need to happen to decarbonize our economy have to be done at the societal level, and we need politicians who are willing to pass those policies rather than simply act as a rubber stamp for polluters. There you go. Dr. Michael Mann, uh, his new book, The New Climate War, is out. Michael Mann with two N's dot net, the website. You can tweet him at Michael E. Mann. Dr. Mann, it's always great having you on, my friend. Thank you so much for dropping by.